You think this thing's still as sharp after, oh, all these years? <laughs> yeah, it is. Silly man. Oh my gosh. Hi, Joe Alton, MD here, also known as Dr. Bones of the survival medicine website, doomandbloom.net, co-author of the 2022 Book Excellence Award winner in medicine, the fourth edition of the Survival Medicine Handbook, plus designer of quality medical kits at store.doomandbloom.net. Any disaster could put your people at risk for injury. Wounds caused by sharp objects can be life-threatening depending on the organs and blood vessels damaged. I think you can imagine a lot of different circumstances where you'll be using sharp objects to accomplish various activities of daily survival. You could define a classic stab wound as a laceration where the length on the skin of the injury is less than the depth of penetration into the body. A slash, however, is generally longer on the skin than deep. Stab wounds tend to enter in line with the long axis of the knife, while slashes, well, they don't. We'll discuss stab wounds in this video. They're a type of penetrating trauma which is further divided into perforating and non-perforating injuries. Penetrating trauma is divided into perforating and non-perforating injuries. A perforating wound is one in which the object causing the damage goes in one side of the body and then exits out the other side. A round from a 223 or a NATO 556, that would be a good example of perforating trauma. Bullets and other high speed projectiles cause damage not only from the act of penetration, but also from the shock wave produced as the bullet passes through the body. Low speed projectiles, such as knives, don't produce much of a shock wave, so your concerns are mostly related to the area of entry and the structures located directly in the path of the offending instrument. So stab wounds are an example of a non-perforating wound. The projectile causing the damage enters the body and either stays there or exits where it entered. Knife wounds don't, unless you can throw one so hard that it goes straight through a person. Some sharp instruments could possibly do this, say, let's say a crossbow bolt or a spearhead, but let's assume that these are less likely than knife wounds, even in a survival setting. With stab wounds, blood loss is going to be the major issue. Your immediate action upon encountering a victim of a wound with a sharp instrument may save their life. The heart takes less than one minute to pump blood to the entire body. If the circulatory system is breached, arterial blood loss can become life-threatening very quickly. Average size adult males have about nine to 10 pints of blood, that's about five liters, in their body. Athletes and those living at very high altitudes actually may have more. You can't afford to lose more than about 40% of your total blood volume without needing some major resuscitation. To get an idea of how much blood this is, empty a two liter bottle of any liquid on the floor. Well, I'll tell you, it's an eye opener. If you're attending to an actively bleeding wound from a sharp object, you're going to need a level head and quick action. If you can, contact emergency services immediately in normal times. In the meantime, follow these steps. Assess the safety of the situation. Make sure there's no active threat. It makes no sense for you to become the next casualty. Put on gloves if you possibly can. Your hands are full of bacteria and you'll reduce the risk of infection by doing so. Nitrile or polyisoprene gloves are superior to latex, which is a material prone to causing allergic reactions. More common than you think. If no gloves are available, plastic bags, wrap, or maybe hand sanitizer at least, well, they will be useful if you have to touch the wound with bare hands. I'll admit you might not have the time to do a lot of cleaning up if the bleeding is that heavy. Verify the victim's breathing and mental status. Clear airways if they're obstructed and determine if they're alert enough to follow commands. In a non-combat setting, remove clothing to fully expose the wound and identify other injuries. Make sure you have a bandage scissors or EMT shears in your medical pack. Apply pressure with some type of dressing, even your shirt if that's all you've got. Most non-arterial bleeding will stop with steady pressure on the wound. If the sharp instrument is still in place in the victim and help is on the way, if help is on the way, place pressure down on either side towards the blade to prevent it from slipping out. The blade may actually be providing pressure on damaged blood vessels and decreasing the bleeding. Stabilize the wound with the weapon in place with dressings or in any other way you can. If one dressing doesn't work and you don't have specialized blood clotting materials called hemostatics, place additional dressings on top of the first one. You want to elevate the feet above the level of the heart and head. They call that the shock position. That helps increase blood flow to the brain. If the wound is to the abdomen, however, you're supposed to bend the knees instead. Lift an injured extremity above the level of the heart. Make it more difficult to pump blood out of the body. 
No luck with direct pressure? Apply a tourniquet to stop the bleeding. Our experience in Iraq and Afghanistan shows that tourniquets save lives in cases of severe or arterial hemorrhage. If the bleeding is obviously arterial, bright red blood spurting out of the wound, using a tourniquet should be your first course of action. See Andres Amy's various videos on this channel explaining the principles of tourniquet use and how to properly use different types of tourniquets. If you're transporting a patient to a modern medical facility, make sure that you mark a T on the victim's forehead or otherwise notify emergency personnel of the location and the length of time that the tourniquet's been in place. I mentioned hemostatics earlier. In cases of severe bleeding, the use of special blood clotting dressings such as quick clots, Celox, or Kytosam is a lifesaver. We put these products in all our medical packs, even the smaller individual first aid kits. In this case, remove blood soaked bandages first and then place the hemostatic dressing directly on the bleeding vessel with direct pressure for three full minutes. Secure everything with a pressure dressing, of which there are various on the market. The Israeli battle dressing, known as the emergency bandage in the U.S., can apply up to 30 pounds of pressure if it's used properly. You want to keep your victim warm. They're in shock. Throw a mylar blanket or other cover over them. If help is coming, keep them as still and calm as possible to avoid further bleeding. Monitor breathing, pulses, and mental status. An unconscious patient should be placed, if possible, in the recovery position. This will, among other things, allow fluid to drain from airways and help them breathe. Let's say you place a tourniquet and there's no help coming. You're the end of the line when it comes to medical care for this victim. If the tourniquet is on, should you loosen it from time to time? You may be tempted to do this, but it can cause further bleeding. That doesn't mean you can leave the victim, now your patient, with a knife sticking out of them forever. Get them to a more controlled setting where you have the bulk of your medical supplies and remove the knife. Yes, I said remove the knife. There's no hospital, there's no trauma surgeon, there's just you. You may have to place a second tourniquet above the first one if bleeding returns. You still want to transition the patient from the tourniquet within, say, two hours or so if you can, to a hemostatic gauze and pressure bandage. Again, this strategy is only for when there is no existing medical infrastructure. Once the bleeding is under control, clean the wound thoroughly and dress it. Wound closure may be an option in some cases, but most backcountry stab wounds will be dirty and should be left open, something I talk about in detail in other videos on this channel. All of the above may not be necessary if you practice preventative measures. In other words, insist your people wear hand and eye protection when using sharp instruments, and don't run with scissors. With some foresight, you may be able to avoid a mishap that could turn into a tragedy. This is Joel Nemdi, that old Dr. Bones, wishing you the best of health and good times or bad. Thanks for watching. Hey, learn more about wounds and wound care in the Amazon Top 20, fourth edition of the Survival Medicine Handbook, and get your family medically prepared with quality kits and individual supplies from store.doomandbloom.net. You'll be glad you did.